work of art is no good sitting in a, someone's study where no one can see it. It needs to be on display. And these cars, they're not only wonderful to look at, they're also wonderful to see. The raw sound of one of these things is just wonderful. My name's Duncan Ricketts. Uh, I've been messing around with old cars for, I suppose, the best part of 30, I don't know how many years now, 40 years, I guess. Um, I started off as a young man, I suppose I was an apprentice when I met uh, a chap called Bill Morris. I got into uh, following Bill Morris around the race circuits and he was into what I thought was a very exotic ERA. Never thought I'd end up racing one, but um, made myself a Riley. Um, was quite successful in that, quite handy on the bodywork, that was my thing. Over the years I realised that I couldn't really afford to employ people to do the mechanical stuff, so I did all the mechanical stuff myself. Um, ended up making my own pistons and conrods and all kinds of things. And uh, an ERA came up, uh, they were looking for someone to drive it. I'd been quite successful at driving and uh, my name, I guess, went into a hat and it came out first. So I ended up with a R1B, which was uh, a very famous ERA 1500cc ex Seaman car. Raced that for years, I think something like 12 years. Um, uh, won lots of races, got quite a few hill climb records and some of them still stand, which is amazing. Um, and then sadly, uh, Sally Marsh, who owned the car, uh, decided to sell it. But as luck would have it for me, at exactly the same time, an ERA came on the market, an E-Type, which was in those days uh, quite ex well, obviously exotic, but no one knew much about them. Uh, it was in bits. I'd already made the body for it back in the 70s for the owner who sadly died. Um, so I managed to um, get enough money together, borrowing some and selling bits and pieces, uh, managed to buy this car. And then it was a two-year sprint to get the thing from being a, a pile of bits to a racing car and that was fantastic and this car um, which is the Challenger uh, it was built in the same year as the E-Type which is a bit odd um, almost exactly the same specification it's um, the Dion rear end uh, which was quite advanced in its day uh, it's got independent front suspension slightly different from the E-Type it's a uh, double wishbone as opposed to Dr Porsche but again I guess uh, Reg Parnell who built the car and the RA were looking at the continental opposition and they were looking at uh, I guess in particular Mercedes auto unions and they were copying bits from them I would imagine and that's what I think um, both cars ended up with the same track which is interesting uh, same wheelbase uh, this car Reg Parnell decided that um, you know England were lacking a little bit with prehistoric in his view, racing cars, you know, very sit up and beg type things. And he wanted to make something much lower, sleeker and more powerful. Parnell had already made the twin cam head for an MG engine. And I think what he did was make the engine to go with the twin cam head that he'd already made. And that was the engine that was going in this. Uh, but sadly, he ran out of time a bit. The war was coming on. The car was finished. Uh, sitting ready for an engine that wasn't finished and the story is that uh, an ERA customer of his had a spare engine it's either a spare engine or it was out of the car itself we don't really know but basically Reg borrowed the engine put it in this car adapted it uh, and did one uh, hill climb at Prescott pre-war he even taped over the ERA logo so people didn't realize it in the ERA but I think most people realized by then it wasn't totally successful, as you wouldn't expect it to be. It was its first outing. Um, then the war came along and the car was put into storage. Um, it seems he had a mad panel beater at the time who decided to take off this lovely body that he'd already made and put some different body panels on and a big long tail. And it didn't look particularly nice at the end of the war years. He obviously had to give the RA engine back. Um, the only other engine he had, which was <laughs> quite amazing when you look back now, but it was a straight eight Delage engine out of one of the Delage, supercharged straight eight Delage engine, 1500s. And he had one of those, so he put that in. No one knows what happened to these own design of engine. That seems to have either, either wasn't done or 
maybe it got scrapped, I don't know. It'd be lovely to find it if anyone's got the information out there, someone has, I guess, but I'm not sure they actually got to finish it. I think it was basically drawn but not finished. But anyway, it ran in the post-war years with the Delage engine. Um, wasn't totally successful. They did silly things. I think they were always trying to reinvent the wheel. They, they, they came up with designs that weren't... Uh, they, they were ahead of themselves, that like they came up with pneumatic front suspension, which I guess, you know, they were trying to make the car better, but all it did is when it got up to speed, it jacked itself up. So if you look at any of the pictures of it pre-war, you'll see, uh, sorry, post-war, you'll see the nose is right up in the air where the suspension's jacked up under speed. And then when it slowed down again, it dropped down. Uh, you know, and he, he did, I think, three or four races with the Delage engine. Um, and then it got to the late, 40s and he was trying to sell the car i've got various articles that you know he, he was putting it out that you know he would he would like uh, the british to make a car and he was basically describing this car and he was trying to uh, present that as a car that they could start with as a uh, uh, you know a, a post-war racing car to compete with the opposition from abroad it eventually, um, I'm not quite sure whether it was sold at the time, but um, a guy called Paul Emery was given the job to make it into a two-seater. Um, the engine by then had already been taken out and he made this very odd looking body that's um, in here. It's not particularly attractive. Uh, he finished it and it had a V12 Lagonda engine put into it um, and it disappeared off into California, it was sold off, and then it was lost. Uh, many years went by, and as an ERA person, I heard, you know, rumours of this car called the Challenger, um, and it was reckoned to be similar to my E-Type that I had, you know, so I was sort of semi-interested in it. And I had a good friend um, called Bill Morris, and uh, he came up with a, an idea that it must still be around, but because it had the Lagonda engine, he thought, I wonder if it's in the Lagonda club in America. So he searched and searched and searched, and he came up with this very odd car that was out in California that was a V12 Lagonda, and everyone said it was an ex Le Mans car, but they couldn't find any history for it. So it was just reckoned to be a bit of a prototype or something that they'd made for Le Mans. And uh, he had a good friend called uh, Dean Butler, um, and Dean was in America quite often, and he asked Dean if he could go over and have a look and see, you know, he knew the person that owned it quite well, so he said he'd pop in and see him, and, and uh, of course, he came back with all these pictures, and uh, this is a story that I've been told, and I think Dean would say it's pretty true. Um, you know, Bill looked at the pictures and saw various things and said, yeah, that's the Challenger, I can, I can tell from the chassis, you know. So Dean then went out, um, with Bill's permission, I mean, Bill had basically found the car, but um, Dean bought it, um, but the guy wanted to keep the body, the two-seater body, which was, I say in here, that shows it very similar to a, a, a Jaguar. There's an E-type Jag, and there's this body that uh, Paul Emery made. And bear in mind, this is 1950. Um, you know, they're very similar cars. The only disappointing thing is the, the nose, which is quite ugly. But anyway, um, a chap called George Chilburn owned it, and uh, he took the body off and Dean brought the remains back with the Lagonda engine, chassis, suspension, uh, with a view to build it back into the Challenger. Uh, but Dean's life got quite complicated for him and I think he realised it was going to cost a lot of money and, you know, he couldn't do it himself, obviously. So he put it on the market for, for sale. So, um, again, it sort of, well, it's it put in my lap. If I wanted it, I could buy it, you know, and we did a deal with, with uh, Dean and the next thing what I had, the Challenger and the E-Type. So that was probably 15 years ago. Uh, and just slowly over the years, I've chipped away at it and um, had to recast the brakes. They were missing, they'd um, been replaced with SS Jag brakes. Uh, little bits and pieces were missing from mechanical. The diff unit was missing that had drop gears in it. So I had to work out what that was all about. Uh, cast one of those up and make all the bits to go inside it. Um, and then eventually I managed to build up a, an ERA engine and I managed to get a, a race box to go with it, which is what it was fitted with for the Prescott event, and scale all the body and make the body. Um, so that took me about 15 years of not total um, time, but uh, 
it got to a point where there was a guy called Sandy uh, Skinner, who was a, a lovely old character, um, well known in the VSEC. He had known about the car for years, and he had, he knew that I'd had it for like 15 years, and I think he wanted to jolly me along a bit with it because it was sort of the body was sort of roughed out, but it wasn't made. Um, I'd roughed out the tail, the scuttle was sort of semi roughed out, had no nose, no bonnet, no side panels, um, and. It's just a project that every so often I would uh, sort of suddenly decide, oh, but better get on with that, and I'd do something too. So he, he said he wanted to do an article on it, and could I finish it um, so we could reenact this Prescott event, uh, which happened last year as it happened. So I sort of committed myself to doing it, and uh, we were just sort of halfway, and he wanted me to take pictures of the car as I went on, the engine in the dyno, you know, the chassis as I was slowly getting the hoops and bits and pieces on it. So we'd taken all these pictures and then sadly Sandy had a, a stroke and he couldn't talk anymore. Or if he did talk, it was gobbledygooch. It was quite difficult to understand him, but he was still there. His brain was still working, but he just couldn't um, convey himself very well. Um, so anyway, I pulled the stops out to try and finish it. And then sadly he died. Um, and so we decided between us that uh, you know, it'd be lovely to have a memorial service for him at Prescott with this car competing. Um, so that was what was decided, uh, which gave me about six months to finish it. And, you know, it was basically, it was unpainted. You know, the chassis was still roughed out. They had brackets on it that shouldn't be on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah we got to a point where uh, the bodywork went on the night before we were due to go to Prescott. Uh, and there were still things like the seat wasn't together. And they just got the upholstery back for the seat. Um, silencer wasn't on. We pushed it in the trailer at 12 o'clock at night. Still no silencer, no seat in it. Uh, I mean, it only just about run. The brakes, oh, we had a hell of a lot of problems with the brakes, just trying to get them all to turn and adjust up and bleed, bleed up. Kyrie and my wife did all the brake pipes on the car because I was running out of time. Anyway, we, uh, we got it to Prescott. First thing in the morning, pushed it out the trailer. And uh, that was the first time I'd seen it, really, because I'd been so flat out with the car through the summer. You just, uh, you know, every day it was just another job. I didn't really look at it. It was in the workshop. For the first time, I stood back and looked at it, and I thought, wow, that's some car, you know, it's really good. Um, anyway, we managed to get it all together. <clears throat> Got to the first run, uh, went off up to third gear, and then there was smoke out the gearbox, and it all sort of went solid. So. I thought that was the end of the uh, the weekend. So um, anyway, we got it there. The car did the memorial. I uh, had a few red wines and sort of chilled out and thought, great, done as best I could. Got it here, ticked all the boxes. Just a shame we didn't get up the hill. Um, and then someone said to me, a friend of mine, Tony Stevens, he said, are you sure the gearbox is ruined? And I said, well, I think so. Because all this smoke came out of it. And he said, well, I've been thinking. I reckon it's selected two gears. It's, it's gripped two gears. Uh, anyway, I thought, well, might as well take the top of the gearbox off and have a look. When I took the top of the gearbox off, there were two gears stuck together. It had selected two. One of the um, adjusters had slipped off the top and gone sideways, and it had just jammed up. Now, I don't know why it did that. I never had one do that before. But anyway, with a bit of messing around and unadjusting and then readjusting up, I managed to get the thing back together. So next thing was, got it had to go to the, um, I'd already scratched it, and that meant we had to be re-scrutineered, had to go through the re -scrutineer. and just about got it done, and then it did three good runs. So that was job done, really, and then, then we've sort of left it, I say we, I've left it through the winter, getting on with other things, and now we've got the members meeting in about, I think it's about four weeks' time at Goodwood, so I'm busy trying to get it ready for that. You'd be surprised how many times you sit in the car in the workshop, wheels off the ground, running the engine, going through the gears. First, second, third, fourth. Fourth, third, second, first. Every time it selects. You go on the track, first time you select a gear, you let the clutch out and it's not in a gear. You're in neutral. And you think, why? And it's to do with things like chassis flex. You know, the chassis just flexes a little bit and the linkage moves slightly. And so you have all those little issues to to mess around with. I, I mean, Reg didn't race it on the track, but 
sort of quite special to be the first person racing it uh, since all that time. So it's quite special. If I can finish the race, its first race, I'll be over the moon. First thing I didn't know about was the start, because the trouble I've had this with the E-Type, you, you, you sit on the line, you've never dropped the clutch before, you suddenly drop the clutch, hit the throttle, and there's a bang and something breaks. You never know if that's going to happen, so that didn't happen, it went off really well. The pack's quite tight when you go off of a 3-2 formation, and you know, you've got to be very careful. I got boxed in with a few cars, so I couldn't really accelerate. If I was open, I'd have been past probably five or six, but Again, the problem is if you're in a, a car that you're not 100% confident with, you don't want to be in a load of cars that are faster than you because all that's going to happen is you're either going to slow them up or maybe you might keep up with them, but you'll be on the ragged edge and I didn't want to be there. So basically the start was fine. Uh, and then I just sort of tried to build the car up and make sure that I was happy with all the turning in points and braking points. and. Down the back straight, I was over revving it really. It went up the seven and I still had half the straight to go down. So I had to back off all the time. And then when you back off, that's another problem. You back off uh, and you sort of just feather the throttle slightly, but then you never know quite when that point is you take your foot off and hit the brake because you're like um, coasting. When you're, on, when you're really on it, you're on it, you're on it, you're on it. And you know when you hit a, 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 a marker, 
it's the time to take your foot off the accelerator and hit the brake. That's how it works. You, you get to that point where you know where that point where your brake is. But when you're doodling, you know, feathering, you sort of suddenly you're coasting into a corner much quicker than you should be. So um, there was a bit of that, but no, it's really good, really lovely. It'd be lovely to think that, you know, the young of today will follow our footprints and still be able to race these things because the reality is they are quite dangerous. There's no safety features. We have a fire extinguisher that's about it, a crash helmet. Um, so you do have to respect the fact that they're dangerous. I mean, we do push them pretty hard. I mean, we're running, I would say 99% you know, percent not quite 100 hopefully sometimes. Um, I always feel slightly uh, worried about youngsters that aren't used to them, but I think it's important that youngsters uh, evolve to these cars. You know, Austin 7, Riley, MG, that kind of thing, slowly building up to finally racing a single-seater supercharged car. Nothing like it really.